I'm Chris and I'm back with one of those AliExpress mini PCs. So I'm taking another gamble here, another risk, buying this super powerful model that just seems too good to be true. It's absolutely crazy what they've crammed in terms of performance into this tiny little portable case that you can easily just place and slip into a backpack. So it has a Core i9, 9900 in this. It's not the K or the KS model, that would just be overboard. And even as it is, this is overboard. So eight cores, 16 threads in this. It's a 65 watt CPU, but it has a dedicated GPU, something that was missing on all those other AliExpress models that I reviewed. This has it, so in theory, we should be able to also upgrade this GPU in the future with other half-height GPUs, and you can also swap and change the CPU as you like to, because it uses the LGA1151 socket from Intel. First, let's take a look at what we get with the box, and this one here is just a generic box they use for all of these mini PCs. It was even used for the last gen one. So you can see it's well padded here. We've got the mini PC, which we'll look at in detail in just a minute because I do have to install all the components. I bought the bare bones one. So we've got this bracket right here, you can see. This is of course for propping it up. They've given us an HDMI cable. We've got some screws in here as well and a cable SATA 3 and then power for that SATA 3. So if you wanted to use, for example, a spindle hard drive or an SSD 2.5 inch one, you're able to with this and I'll show you that. So here is our power supply. Now this is rated to 19 volts, 9.47 amps, and it's a good size. Now Hunt Key, I do recognize this name, this brand of power adapters, and you should be able to source a replacement. It's using that four pin style one, as you can see, and then they've given me an EU plug. For this review, I installed 32 gigabytes of HyperX DDR4 CL15 RAM, which is very quick and a Samsung 970 EVO drive as my SSD. One of the reasons this mini PC is so small yet packs a dedicated GPU is it's because it's using one of these cute little half height GPU cards. It only runs on PCIe power and for reference above it is a 2.5 inch SSD. These GPUs are tiny. So it might be tiny, but it definitely does not lack on ports. We've got two audio jacks there, four USB 3 ports, gigabit LAN, two HDMI 1.4 outs, DC in for power of course, display port, HDMI 2 and DVI. So you can run a lot of monitors with this little mini PC. And up the front, not so great because it just has three USB 2 ports here and our power button. Now it does have a status LED right here and this is a transparent, what looks like screen, but it's actually just plastic. That is where the wireless antennas are. So the case is completely made out of metal. It has a brushed finish with this plastic protector on the top to stop you from scratching it when you install all of your components. So the length of it is 26 centimeters. It is only five centimeters high and weighs just 1.6 kilos, making it super easy to transport and place in a backpack, for example. So first up, just installing my RAM. So this is very easy to do. If you have never installed RAM into a, a laptop, then I'll quickly explain it, that you just need to line up where the pins are. See the gap and make sure you've got the right spec. That's the most important thing first. So DDR4 and SODIMM laptop RAM. So you simply place it in like this, push it right up and then push it down. Make sure that these clips either side are clipped into place. And that is it, that RAM is installed. Now this surprised me, I didn't expect to see this, a 12 volt out connector on the motherboards. That's great to have this. Now the wireless antenna and the wireless cards are a little bit more tricky because we've got the connector right here. They do have the antenna, which is on that front part of the case. And they just put a bit of tape around this here. So this is what we need to take this off, this tape. And then those connectors will connect up then to the tiny little wireless card. So those two antenna plugs, simply place them over the top here where it's labeled one and two. There's no particular order here because I know there's a main and auxiliary antenna, but this case is using the same exact antenna for both. So it doesn't matter. So place the little connector over the top, press it down with your finger now, and you should feel a little click and then it's in place. So the wireless card is in place. You just push it in and make sure you use that bottom slot because the top one, well, it's not gonna screw in place. And that's for our SSD, which I'm gonna install now. So this one is just a matter of lining it up like that little mini PCIe wireless card. Give it a press, so you gotta push it into place and then screw it down into place. All right, like so. And that is it, your SSD and wireless card 
is now installed. And then let's connect up that 2.5 inch drive that I showed you. So you can use the SSD or hard drive, of course. So this is a SATA power cable, connect that up to it. And then right here, we've got the SATA 3 connected to, so push that into place. And then we need to connect it to the motherboard. I will show you where. You'll find the connectors on the motherboard just above the RAM here. So that's where the power is and SATA 3. So SATA 3 cable, just simply place it over the top and press it down into place like so. Power cable to line it up, never force these cables as well. So you can see that's the wrong way around. So you've got to flip it around and then push it down into place. There we go, that is now secure. So that SSD you then screw onto the backing plate here in place. So once you've completed that, screw everything back into place. You want to power it up first, go straight into the BIOS, which is normally delete or escape. And then you can set the boot order of your hard drives or SSD. So when you get this out of the box, there is a restriction that they have set in the BIOS straight away. You cannot get the performance you expected. Why they have done this is to probably keep the thermals really good. And I noticed straight away that you're getting this current limit throttling and it will not actually turbo over about 3.2 on all of the cores and the thermals stay ridiculously good for such a tiny cooler with those powerful eight cores, 65 watts. And what I did was in under volt right here and if you change this limit, set this to something like 140, then you can let the CPU really boost right up to the maximum supported, which is 4.6 gigahertz across all of those eight cores. And you'll occasionally see it flashing there. So when you stress test, I wanna get into these thermals straight away because I know that this is the question that everyone's gonna have is, will it thermal throttle? It will, okay, you'll see it doesn't take long. I mean, the fan hasn't even ramped up yet. 85, 82, and that is stressing out all those cores. You can see it is holding though the 4.6. There we go, fan has now kicked in. It'll bounce around 90, but when you're gaming, it'll stay in the 70s as you'll see later on. So the thermals for such a hot CPU, the cool is actually doing okay, but you will see it happen. You will see thermal throttling being triggered, power limit right now throttling as well. So I haven't changed any of the power limits. There's no point, 65 watts, power limit one, leave it as is. If you increase this, it will then be just throttling like crazy. You can see it has actually throttled down a little bit. So this is the thing we're gonna have. We're never gonna get the exact kind of performance you'd expect from the CPU. And I'll show you some, some benchmarks here. So we'll go over them. Pause is your friend, okay? Hit pause if you wanna look at these in detail a little more. So the first score with Geekbench 4 here, super low. I mean, this is a really, Terrible score, and that was with their 60 set to the ICC max, just 60 there, severely restricting the CPU. Change that, and then look what happens. We start getting some really, really good scores here. Here's Geekbench 5, which I am now using. Again, a really good score here. I'm gonna go pretty quick with these. OpenCL score, this is from the GPU, so that GTX 1650. And here we have the OpenCL with Geekbench 4. They're good scores, but the GPU, of course, is the bottleneck with this particular system. Passmark score, again, really, really good, 7,000. And here is the Fire Strike. So this, I don't think is actually that bad for the type of GPU this is. Graphics score coming up close to 10,000. Physics is almost 24,000. Really good there again. Time Spy, and someone asked me to run this via Demon Twitter. I don't like user benchmark. But hey, here it is, here are the results. You can see that it's getting an average there of 96, so that's not bad. I mean, the best score there is 103%, so all in all, good. Now, the typical other benchmarks people wanna see with such a powerful CPU, Cinebench. So here is uh, Cinebench R15 score, very good again. And take a look at that CB score, and R20 as well. Now. Bear in mind that if you had the 9900K clock to five gigahertz across all the eight cores, then the score would be about 5,000. So that is a really good score. This is a super powerful little mini PC. It's what I got it for, CPU Z benchmark too as well. Again, remember to hit pause if you wanna see any of these benchmarks in detail, compare it to your own system so you know what kind of performance to expect from this. And 6,500. Medium preset here for super position benchmark. 
So I will do a run here just to those that are interested about those thermals. So I'm going to run. This is Sydney Bench R15. See what kind of score I get. So I just hit run here and bring back up our extreme tuning utility. So you see it's doing and holding the 4.6 across all of those eight cores for now. But look at that. 100 degrees it just hit. Package temperature. Thermal throttling, of course. So this is not good to see this. But it's really the only time... I am seeing those temperatures is very briefly until it throttles. So we're not getting maximum performance out of really super demanding apps, applications and things like that. But for what I need this mini PC for, for things like video editing, it's working out good for me and I'm not really seeing those temps. Gaming as well, as you'll see later on, it will stay around the 70s and 80s. So the cooler is good and then at the same time, it is bad. And I have not repasted it as well. So if I repaste the thing, it'll probably be a little bit lower. I don't expect a huge change because it's such a tiny cooler trying to cool this down. It's a basically a gaming notebook cooler trying to cool down a 65 watt processor when they normally handle 45 watts max. So you see the temperatures are good there. So that has finished in the background there. Okay, that run was a lot less because of the throttling. So you just have to really find the balance between the ICC and undervolting to get maximum performance out of this particular mini PC here. So one thing I have not seen is that single core, it's supposed to run up to five gigahertz and then the just dual core performance, just using the two threads, five gigahertz, never seen it. It's always 4.6 max. That's all I'm getting with this bias. So there is another little restriction there. But now let's have a look at just a few titles very quickly gaming. So what you can expect from that GTX 1650, not a powerful GPU, but it's great we do have a dedicated GPU on this and not integrated like all the other mini PCs I have been reviewing. This game, even in 2020, does still look very good. This is the medium setting preset that I have at the moment. And we're getting around 80 frames per second, quite steady there, so very playable and smooth. Even for such a low-end card, it's doing fine. I mean, this is off the Turing architecture, but it does not support your ray tracing, of course, not with this low-end card. So the CPU, all of those eight cores, Running cool and not even being taxed, really. So, of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, the bottleneck is that GPU. Now, GPU is currently at 70 degrees. The highest I've seen it get up is 76. That's very similar to other GTX 1650 CPUs. Now, we'll set it to high. We'll see how it runs then on the high option. I do believe it will still be playable even with this low-end card. So, now on high, we'll hit apply and out of this again. All right, so, oh, okay, below 60 frames per second. It looks quite a bit better, of course, and still just playable 1080p. Now, I did test it at 4K. 4K, we're getting around 30 frames per second. I'm not happy with that. It's just too choppy. That was on the medium preset. This one is Shadow of Tomb Raider, a more modern title, still quite demanding, and I'm going to run it on just the high preset, okay? Run the benchmark, but you'll see, like I'm saying here, that all games will run fine on this card, at 1080p. So just before I wrap up the video, I wanted to mention a couple other things, useful information that people probably want to know. BIOS. I haven't shown you in this video because there's nothing to show you. It's locked down completely. However, there are a couple of handy settings in there. Of course, boot order, you need that. That has to be there. But the other one is, that the power state, it will detect if it powers off, you can set an option in there so when it regains power, it will automatically boot up. So if it's gonna be a server, for your example, on a remote switch, that is actually possible to do that. Now, power consumption, let's talk a little bit about that, that it's drawing and pulling up to peaks of about 100 watts on the CPU, the GPU is pulling quite a bit as well, and I haven't run into any issues with the power supply so far, I thought that, okay, Maybe it's not going to be able to take it, take the eight cores. This is where it's surprising me. I've pushed it very hard for a week. It has never powered itself off due to this. The only time it has completely powered off for me was my own fault because I set too high of an undervolt. So let's talk about then what you need to do to get that performance because it's so ridiculous. The manufacturer with this, they set an ICC max so low that this CPU just cannot even turbo properly. And why are they doing this? They're playing it ultra safe. They want to keep those thermals down so you don't have fan noise, you don't have any thermal throttling. 
but you can open it up. As I showed you, you get the maximum eight core, 4.6 gigahertz turbo, and performance is absolutely insane and amazing for such a small system. That's where you need to undervolt a little bit, and you really need to find that balance between the current limit and then undervolting to what you want. Thermals, do you wanna push the thermals crazy high? Because they're not good if you just let it use all the current it wants, all the power it wants, this gets up, as you saw, to 100 degrees. That's not acceptable, that is not good. We don't want that long-term 100 degrees, it's gonna end up burning out or damaging something right here. So the motherboard components, what gets really hot in here is the chipset. It does have a heatsink on the top of it, as it should, so that is good to see. The graphics card gets up to about 75 degrees, 76 max. So that is also another good area. I found that my Samsung SSD is actually getting very hot. Now there is a possibility to run a system fan on this. If you wanted to, you could put like a 140 if it would fit millimeter fan inside here just at a low RPM. And that then will allow you to cool, say the internal component CPU a little bit more. Now you could modify, I may repaste the CPU and see if I can get slightly better temperatures, but I doubt it. We're talking about basically a gaming notebook cooler with two thermal transfer heat pipes trying to cool down what is used to only cooling 45 watt processor to an additional 20. So this is 65 watts on such a small cooler. Of course, we're gonna run into problems as I expected, but that's kind of why I went for the eight core version so we can see worst case scenario with this mini PC. I can see now that you'll probably wanna to stick to the Core i7 and the Core i5 models, which are cheaper. So yes, you can build this exact spec with probably a better GPU for cheaper, a good 150, 100 euros cheaper. But this is really for the convenience and this form factor being so small, portable, and with this custom motherboard as well. Now we should be able to upgrade these components in the future, the GPU, more manufacturers, I'm crossing my fingers, will start to produce more of these half height, tiny little GPUs. We're hopefully gonna see something like the 1660 uh, super version or even a TI, it could be a little bit too hot. It probably might need actually external power. Now we do have, the 12 volt connector in here, which is good to see. So we've got a few little options with this particular motherboard and case. So really what it boils down to is, what do you want this for? For me, it is video editing, and that's where I think it is good. But of course the thermals is an area of concern. So that's why I say, perhaps go for the Core i7. Thank you so much for watching this review. I hope it was informative. And now you know that this mini PC to me is actually not bad at all. Now, if this video does okay and there's a lot of interest, I may look at some of those smaller 9th gen ones that are using the 45 watt laptop processors in them. Review a couple of those and see if those are also any good. Thank you so much for watching. Please do give a like if you did like this particular video and subscribe too to the channel if you're new. Bye for now.